Okay, I see a few people logged in. Just wanted to welcome you to today's program. Uh, I'm John Haber with the California Preservation Foundation. Before we get going, you'll notice some uh, slides on your screen um, with more information about some upcoming programs for CPF, as well as our awards nomination period. Our annual appeal is right now, so we would appreciate any donations to our 501c3 uh, to support the historic preservation in um, California, the protection of historic buildings in California and historic places. Uh, we have our annual auction. You can find more information about the auction by visiting californiapreservation.org slash bid. Um, in fact, one of the featured items today is a private tour with John Gone of his workshop, and we hope you'll visit that. Uh, we'll paste the link in a moment here into the chat box. Um, a little more information about uh, closed captioning today. This program is closed captioned. You can click on the closed captioning at the bottom of the screen to view a live caption. If that is disruptive, you can also click the arrow next to the caption button to hide it. Uh, we do have a full uh, transcript available of today's program, and we will be broadcasting it live to Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. In fact, it's currently live on those platforms. If you have any issues with Zoom, you can always jump over to Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn and find us there. The recording for today's program will be available after the uh, program today at those uh, sites. So you can visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash calpreservation or at facebook.com slash CA preservation. And you can find the video of today's program. This is part of a three-part series, a special three-part holiday series that CPF does every year connected to our annual appeal. So we encourage you to consider giving to the organization by visiting californiapreservation.org slash give. We'll start here in about two minutes. Okay, welcome everybody to today's program. My name is John Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. And with me today, I have Cindy Heitzman with the Executive Director of the California Preservation Foundation. Today's program is a very special part of a three-part series that we are now doing yearly during our annual appeal. Um, our annual appeal is a special opportunity for you to get to make your gift annual gift to the California Preservation Foundation by visiting californiapreservation.org slash give. Cindy, would you like to men mention anything about our series of programs or the annual appeal this year? Yeah, I would. Thanks, John, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, we are pleased to launch our third um, holiday program. Um, kicking off with uh, a series of illusion. And we're looking forward to this today, have some great people speaking. 
Uh, we would encourage all of you to attend all three programs. They're going to be offered. And the dates are available on our website. If you didn't catch it in the slides, we sent out notices about the programs. Uh, we'd also encourage you to visit our auction page. We have some great um, auction items this year and all the proceeds from the auction and our annual appeal support our work throughout the year. So we would encourage you to, to bid often and frequent <laughs> and bid high on those auction items. Um, and lastly, just a note that um, we really do need the support of everyone who uh, benefits from our programs. So we would encourage you to make a donation to support CPF for our work in 2023. John, I'm going to turn it back to you, and I'm going to disappear while you introduce our speakers. Thank you, Cindy, very much. Um, as Cindy mentioned, our annual auction is currently open. It closes on next Friday at 8 p.m., actually 7.59.59. So make sure you put in your bids early. Um, we're looking forward to the healthy competition among people that arises from that, those auction items, particularly an auction item that I'm excited about that involves one of our speakers today. And at this point, I'm going to, go, going to introduce our first speaker of three speakers today, Mr. John Gon. And John, I'm going to ask to turn on your video here. Thank you, Mr. Gon. Um, now, John Gon is a historian of magic and a longtime producer of some of the world's top illusions. Um, and he has some wonderful stories to, to tell about his work in the field. His shop in Los Angeles uh, is just a treat to visit. And uh, he's offering, he's generously offered a private tour for uh, you and your friends of his very uh, wonderful collection of um, magical items that span hundreds of years of history. So, John, I'd love to hear more about your work and your history and um, feel free to take it away. Good. Well, so glad to be here and with all of you. And uh, just to give you a little background, uh, uh, I primarily uh, designed and built illusions for professional magicians or uh, any illusionary live theater type of things, whether it's touring shows or Broadway shows, uh, uh, whatever, that type of thing. And I am here, like I say, in Los Angeles, and uh, I have been out here since, oh, uh, the early 60s. And I started uh, with a magic show that was on television back in the 60s called The Magic Land of Alakazam. It was a children's show uh, on, on Saturday mornings, and uh, I was uh, just kind of a... Uh, a helper, gopher type of a guy, but I love to work with my hands. And I was keenly interested in, in magic and illusion uh, at an early age. So uh, here I am still doing the same thing, believe it or not, but uh, there's been a lot of sidetracks and, and uh, going down uh, other roads. Uh, uh, a, a lot of the things that we do here now are restoration on on mechanical things uh, such as a uh, automata and uh, free moving type of uh, illusions. And uh, some of the projects that we're involved in right now, we're working uh, on uh, with a Kabuki theater in Tokyo that we've been involved with for a number of years. And we're starting work uh, all the way across in London on a uh, theater project there where we're, we're trying to build an illusion that uh, it kind of emulates uh, the, the walking on the ceiling type of thing that Fred Astaire did in one of his films, I think back in the early 1950s where he's dancing and then he starts walking, dancing up the side of the wall and then on the, on the ceiling. So. Uh, we're doing that for uh, a theater, and of course, uh, that the illusion of that show was that they had built a complete room and uh, put the the camera locked it down on on the floor, and they would rot rotate the whole room as uh, Fred Astaire would uh, would dance, of course, on on the bottom of it as the room turned around. 
So we don't have the luxury of doing that. So uh, we're having to figure a way to magically float uh, the dancer up the side and upside down and around doing all of that. So we're in the process of trying to accomplish that right now. But uh, along the way to these things, we've done uh, so many things, uh, a lot of touring uh, shows for rock groups and over the years and uh, wonderful experiences all the way back to uh, oh, Alice Cooper and Elton John in the early days and uh, all the way through Michael Jackson's and, and so many of them. And uh, right, right now, well, along the way, uh, one of the one of the illusions I was always keenly interested in, and it was always in the the magic books that uh, I had in my library, and it was the automaton chess player, made in uh, six, uh, 1769 in Vienna, Austria. It was made for the court of Maria Theresa. And it was made as a kind of a, a novelty or showpiece just to entertain her, her personal friends. And the, the man that had made this thing, invented it, is, if you will, was named uh, Wolfgang von Kempelen. And he worked for Maria Theresa as an engineer and worked around the, the properties and, and it was a very clever man as far as uh, uh, engineering of uh, water uh, uh, water troughs and they moved around in fountains and steam uh, a lot a lot of clever things like that but he was also uh, unbeknownst to many people he was a uh, uh, had a keen interest in 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 magic uh, simple magician solutions and so he spent six months in in 1769 building the first automaton chess player called the Turk. And he debuted this thing and it, uh, to the delight of the audience and even he, him, because he didn't know it would go over this well. And it, it created such a sensation uh, across Europe that uh, the queen made him take it on, on tour all through the countries and even all the way over into London. And the, the, the newspaper reports on, on this was not that the, they had created a machine that plays chess, but they had created a thinking machine. And uh, this uh, is what really started the Industrial Revolution in Europe and a simple magic trick, as it turns out. So uh, over the years, uh, I have... I built uh, this thing several times, uh, more than several, and I'm still working on it now. But it's uh, it's interesting that something that's 250 years old, that when you demonstrate it, it still fools everyone. So uh, that's uh, one of my accomplishments. <laughs> but uh, it's it's mostly uh, illusion in in live theater. We've done some. Uh, film things, uh, but uh, very few. Some uh, we made a, a wheelchair for. Uh, uh, it was Forrest Gump, yeah, Lieutenant Dan. Remember, he had uh, uh, his legs uh, uh, amputated in the war, and so he was in a wheelchair all the time. So we had to develop a wheelchair that would uh, work for a uh, film, and it it was. Uh, the difference between film illusion and 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 what we kind of do is it only the film thing only has to work once and off to the side you can have fifty people pulling strings or or even nowadays uh, even worse it's all turned into CG and uh, or the graphics of digital animation so. Uh, that's put uh, a lot of wonderful people in, in Hollywood kind of out of work. And uh, it's, it's, uh, they're still out there and they're still creating these illusions, but they're, they've kind of gone into amusement parks and that sort of thing. And um, 
I'm not sure and is if anyone has any questions out there, I'll be able to answer them for you here. Cindy? Yeah, John, uh, that, that's a great uh, sort of overview of your work and your life. Um, I actually was curious about some of the Houdini items in your collection. Can you tell us about those? Ah, yeah. Uh, well, I... I have a, a, a very nice collection of uh, antique magic apparatus, but I I don't really collect it for who it belonged to, uh, but I, I love the craftsmanship and the ingenuity and the fact that somebody would do, go to that much trouble just for a little magic trick. That That's what uh, uh, kind of thrills me. And, but the Houdini things that I have have uh, kind of uh, come along the line and Oh, what I have uh, in there now, well, one of the things that I made uh, was a a little maquette, a, a little kind of a model, a full-scale model, well, let's say three-quarter scale, of Houdini in his office in uh, around 1923, 24. And it's Houdini at his desk, and he is uh, he will sign his, uh, his name on a, a, a little presentation card and we would give it to the people that come by the shop and we had built that for a conference that we uh, put on for magicians and the reason for that Houdini's uh, signature goes for so much uh, money on uh, in auctions right nowadays it would be great if the Houdini himself could actually autograph everyone's program so we built a model of Houdini in the room and and all of that, but we created a, um, a signature machine, very similar to uh, 300, 400 years ago, the same way with an XY uh, angle to it and then a rise to it. So uh, it's it, uh, it works very simply and, and, and very well, and it signs Harry Houdini. But the uh, other things in, in there are, um, Pieces were uh, in his 1926 uh, tour show. Uh, he died in, in the, on Halloween in 1926. But in the early part of the year, he had um, somebody named Rudy Slosher had built him two mechanical uh, growing rose bushes that he would have on each side of the stage. And he would pretend to water one, one of them and then and then go across stage and water the other one. But they, they were so ingeniously built. It, it started out as Houdini with a flower pot with a little flower in it. And he would put it over there on the table and then cover it with a silk uh, scarf and, uh, and, and water it in it. You could see it grow. And then after several minutes, he pulled the scarf off. And there is a, a very good sized tree and he would, pick it up and uh, without giving too much away because I don't like giving away illusions but the the flower pot uh, on the table would split apart in three sections and then the tree and its leaves would come up from the table itself slowly by this wonderful worm drive mechanism and the tree would grow and then at the end of it the flower pot would come back together grasping the tree and Houdini could grab the whole bush with a pot, and it had looked like it had grown in the pot. So there were very many uh, clever things into Houdini's show at that time. That's that's amazing. I I actually also wanted to ask about your colleague uh, Jim Steinmeier as well, because I'm I'm sure the two of you have worked together or you know each other quite well, and um, we were hoping to have him on, but he was uh, busy today. So uh, maybe you can talk yeah, a little bit a about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering uh, this whole connection between illusion, architecture, environment, uh, and sort of the built side of things, which we'll talk more about later in the program with our other speakers. But um, Jim worked a lot for uh, Disney Imagineering. So I imagine he was involved in maybe the, the, the attractions at the theme parks. Um, how, how does that connect to the work that you do? And um, 
th this whole connection between the built environment and, and illusion and magic. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Well, Jim Steinmeier, of course, wears uh, many hats, and he's a, a wonderful writer. He's uh, written dozens and dozens of uh, books on magic. And when he was at Disney, he uh, I don't even know the scope of his work over there because a lot of it was kind of confidential. But I know the projects that he and I have worked together on. Uh, with uh, We did all of the dung hit hitting shows together over the years. Uh, great uh, great illusions that Jim came up with uh, and that I, I would build. And, um, and, and that was uh, great live theater performances. And even the Doug's television specials were live, which is unheard of for a magic show because so many things can go wrong. But uh, the, the first four or five of them were live on a yearly basis. And then, uh, We've done um, uh, other projects. We did uh, Beauty and the Beast on Broadway together and the, the illusions inside there. One of them was a, a great levitation uh, that was, uh, of course, the beast on the floor has, has died and he slowly uh, starts floating up and comes to life and, and rotates around and uh, up in the air. And then you can see him turning into the prince and he comes down and just touches the floor and immediately walks forward. And uh, that was very successful to, to make uh, something like that would, that would work every night and uh, on its own. So uh, there were, there were other uh, pieces in there, but I remember that the, the best. John, I'm not hearing you. I muted myself. That was my fault. Uh, um, I'm hoping you'll hang around with us until about 1 p.m. because we'll be doing a full panel discussion with the rest of the speakers, and then we'll um, we'll probably have some more questions for you then. Thank you for your time to. today. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Alex Chinnick. Now, Alex uh, was hoping to join us today, but he had a family thing come up. And he's going to be coming for the Q&A portion likely at 1 p.m. But he and I got together this morning and we were able to make a recording of his presentation. So I wanted to let everybody know that we'll be playing the recording right now. Um, he prepared this presentation specifically for today's program. And I'll give you a little bit of background on Alex. Now, Alex, he's a British sculptor known for creating uh, temporary public artworks. And uh, he's sort of been described as the Banksy of glass uh, and his more recent works, including uh, include a building located in Covent Garden designed to appear as if it's floating in the air, a house on Southwark Street made from 7,500 paraffin wax bricks, which slowly melted. Um, and then also the, um, uh, the installation uh, of a, a box hall Corsa suspended upside down in South Bank Center car park. And um, The Guardian has called uh, Chinook a master of architectural illusion. So without further ado, I'm going to turn my video off here, and then I will uh, share the video here. And this will be about 20 minutes in length. And then we'll uh, close with a final presentation by John Pugh. Hello, um, thank you very much for having me. My name is Alex Chinook and I'm a British artist and I'm particularly interested in the discipline of sculpture. But my work amalgamates architecture, engineering, theatre design also. Um, I create very large public artworks to very small crafted objects. Um, but they all seem to have a common thread in that what I try to do is I try to take the everyday world that surrounds and contains us and make it feel momentarily extraordinary. Um, I'll start by talking about my first public artwork, which kind of happened by accident. It was an extension of a sculptural investigation that I was doing in my studio where I was trying to create these symmetrically or identically smashed mirrors. 
um, which is actually extremely difficult to do well. And I then started mucking around with smashed glass and I thought it would be interesting to create this sculptural narrative, but across an architectural elevation where the work belongs. And I found a dilapidated factory in Hackney in East London. And I created this illusion, which is 312 identically smashed and cracked windows using 1,248 pieces of glass. Um, this was on a, a kind of derelict and utterly dilapidated factory. The, I know this talk kind of centers around architecture and illusion. So I thought I'd focus on the buildings a little bit and the story of those, because that's always quite an interesting part of each project. And this was a completely empty building and it was full of three stories of soil. And for about two years, it had been used to harvest cannabis. And so when I went in there, um, it was full of rats and asbestos and foxes. And um, it was a pretty brutal project, but we carried on. and. Uh, one by one, I installed these panes of glass, and this was a replica of the smashed pane on that particular facade. And what was wonderful is when we finished it, and ironically, no one smashed the windows anymore on that particular building. And what I loved was that there was this integration of art into architecture, into the public realm, and I kind of stumbled upon this idea of public art. Uh, it's not something I'd set out to achieve. And I loved this idea that there was a kind of subtlety to it by through this this kind of neat integration into the context the work had ability had an ability to disappear and you would find it rather than it find you and it wouldn't scream for attention at the same time i was making small studies and small material investigations so for me um the, the notion of illusion i like illusions because they ask questions in visual ways and that can only really be answered through looking and their playful capacity gives them an accessibility that anybody can understand and hopefully enjoy. And they're visually engaging. So for me, they have a lot of the critical ingredients that a public artwork should have. And part of the way I kind of try to defy logic or transcend our understanding of the physical world that surrounds us, because that's kind of what sculpture is, is certainly the rearrangement of the material world that surrounds us. And I try and do that through kind of kind of defying the material nature of, proper, of, of of the fabric of the built environment. And one of those is brick. And so I started creating these investigations or small studies, as I like to call them, where we created the illusion that brick was bending. And we started by doing this in a very small way, in a very kind of, kind of exploratory, study-esque way. But, and I really like the effortlessness and the simplicity of this. So we took this concept and we went out and tried to found, find a building. And we found this dilapidated council owned building in Margate in the South of England. And we set about kind of applying again, the architectural narrative to that particular illusion. And we created this, which was called from the knees of my nose to the belly of my toes, where we created this illusion that the front of the property was kind of sliding down into the front garden. And again, this was one of my early public artworks. And we didn't really tell anyone about it. There wasn't really a plan attached to this. I was just desperate to achieve it. And we had to beg, borrow and steal from all different companies and sponsors and partners to pull it off. Um, that's the nature of public art, certainly at the outset. You, you know, there's far more artists than there are opportunities. So you have to facilitate your own. And the way I did that was through kind of collaboration with brick companies and um, just kind of facilitating partnerships to make the work possible. And the reception to this was kind of mind blowing, I suppose. It was, it was a significant, um, it was a significant moment in the evolution of my career in the sense that, you know, we finished it. And then the next day, all of the TV crews, the, all of the kind of the press, many members of the public were there and it had an enormous kind of reach. And I was, extremely excited by this idea of creating artwork that could be seen by millions of people and was being seen by millions of people. I mean, before that, when I was creating artworks for galleries, it wasn't really working in that sense. You know, I might get 10 people there and now maybe 10 people would enjoy, 10 million people would enjoy the work. So I was really beginning to enjoy the reach of public art. Um, this was a, a project that we made at the same time where we created the illusion that a building was upside down. Uh, we created, we took a, an existing, again, a dilapidated property, and we just created this very simple trick. 
And what I liked was that, again, that it was so easy because of its contextual integration to walk past the sculpture. And um, there was this great balance of subtlety and spectacle. And all, really what it was about was kind of taking familiarity and intertwining it with this idea of fantasy. I'm really interested in surrealism and I love surrealism. And I always say that I think that kind of surrealism is best served on a bed of familiarity. It's about taking the things we know or think we know and that we understand or believe to understand and just playfully disrupting them. And for me, that's kind of what surrealist sculpture in the in the contemporary sense is, is the kind of the, 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 the playful, uh, the accessible and the ambitious disruption of the things that we know, uh, a kind of positive rejection of reality and um, the playful kind of intertwining of magic into that experience. And we did this very well here. I mean, this was in Covent Garden. So um, it, it was in the middle of the piazza. So it was a temporary intervention, but the, the piazza has kind of got this very theatrical and performative history and magic runs through that. And there's all these street performers of people kind of hovering or objects seemingly hovering. So I thought it'd be great to create a hovering building. So we made a full size replica of one of the buildings on the piazza. Um, and then through engineering, it, it, it completely felt like it was hovering. And this was installed for a, a, a month and it welcomed almost a million visitors. And it was on the national news in 35 different countries. So again, the reach was significant. And it was this cocktail of accessibility and ambition and creating astounding physical sculptures that again, hopefully as many people could see, understand and enjoy. And this is a very kind of contemporary activation in a historical setting and on a historical structure. And at the same time, we're carrying on creating our sculptural investigations. And that goes across kind of playing with engineering, but also playing with chemistry. And we'd been mucking around with wax bricks. So we built this brick wall that we thought we would try and melt. And we did. And me being me and not really thinking things through, we then thought, well, the obvious next step is to build an entire wax house. And that's what we did. We built this two-story house. But what was nice about this was this was on the site of where a candle making factory once stood. So it really resonated with the historical situation as well as the kind of the particular context, which was near London Bridge Station, which had people passing every day. So you could tell a story of the sculpture over time. And there's very much a beginning, a middle and end to the experience. Some days it was incredibly beautiful, other days utterly brutal. But the house slowly melted um, to the ground. And we've always mucked around with kind of temporary interventions on uh, dilapidated buildings. I mean, the nice thing about old buildings that are kind of pending demolition is you have sculptural freedom. And sculptural freedom is crit critical to me. And the way I achieve that is partly through using structures that are temporary, creating stru temporary structures, um, which aren't prohibited by the material and structural long-term performance of the, of the sculpture. And sometimes on empty buildings pending demolition. And this was one of those. It was a kind of 1950s office block near where I live in Kent in the UK. So we thought it would be cool to go there and install this, which was the illusion of an unzipping office block. And then we scaled that up and created this. This was um, our unzipping building in Milan. And um, what we did was we kind of went around the city and photographed and documented different architectural elements of the kind of old historic fabric of Milan. And then we amalgamated them into this, the design for this facade. And we created this huge unzipping building that was illuminated at night. And this was installed for six days during Milan Design Week and it welcomed over 200,000 visitors in person. As a sculptor, I always love the sides more than the front because that kind of shows the fluidity. But they all share this visual language of kind of fluidity and typically inflexible materials. And as a sculptor, I find that very satisfying. But we also do tricks with immense engineering. I mean, this, this has over 100 tons of concrete in the ground, but this was our inverted electricity pylon, which is 37 meters tall. And it's on the Greenwich Peninsula, which was home to the largest oil and gas works in Europe. So it has this history of power generation and supply. 
So again, and the neighboring structures are a kind of redundant lattice gas tower and the Millennium Dome. So this visual language of lattice steel is very important in the conception of the, of the sculpture. Sorry, excuse me. Very important in the kind of conception of the idea, the surroundings and context can form the idea and the sculptural response. It sometimes means that the sculptures aren't necessarily as playful or as inevitably popular as others, but the right response is not always the most popular one. It, and some sculptures have an immediate impact, some need time. Um, and this is illuminated at night, but this gives you a kind of sense of the ambition. Um, in terms of the kind of visual trickery of manipulating steel and creating complex kind of sculptural shapes and engineered structures, this is a spiral staircase that we constructed. I thought it'd be nice to show some of the fabrication images just to give a kind of scale of the ambition and the complexity of the objects. But that became this. And this was on a pre-existing building. Um, and this is 25 meters high, weighs four tons, and it's a non-repeating kind of helical form. And um, I just enjoyed this idea of this kind of explosion of energy. Again, as a sculptor, the side elevation is always my favorite. But they all have this common thread of fluidity, illusion, and kind of taking something we think we know and understand and disrupting it in a highly ambitious and sculptural way. And we always create these studies, as I say, and this kind of flows into larger artworks. This was our cracked building <coughs> in Hammersmith in London. And while we're creating very large outdoor public artworks, we also create kind of smaller works that continue the sculptural language inside. So this is our unzipping floor. Now, to create this, we had to excavate a factory floor a meter down just to create this pit and then re pour the floor to create this the illusion of the unzipping floor. So there's always this sense of kind of minimalism and familiarity, but presented with a large dose of fantasy. This was in Germany, in a museum in Germany. And um, we were invited to create a kind of big installation for inside the museum. But I thought it would be cool to kind of create the illusion that we'd seemingly introduced nothing materially. I thought it couldn't get more minimal than that. So <clears throat> inside the museum, there were these beautiful wooden 450-year-old columns. And um, they, they're the kind of key prominent feature within the space. So I thought it would be great to kind of create this illusion that we tied one in a knot. Again, this illusion of fluidity in a typically inflexible material. And also that, that kind of contemporary intervention and the wonder of it was heightened by the seeming historic age, you know, the age of the object that we were manipulating. And so we introduced a kind of artificial straight column to give the installation symmetry and then seemingly tied one in a knot. And this is where I began to fall in love with knots. Um, and I think what's so lovely about a knot is it's an ever changing sculptural form and it's a very flowing, wonderful 3D object. And that led on to these, and this is our post boxes. And now this really is about taking the everyday kind of object that slips into our subconscious and then using sculptural intervention and play to kind of bring it back into our focus. And for me, it's those particular objects and materials that are ripe for surrealist intervention. And I think there's something wonderfully optimistic about defying reality and rejecting restriction. And in the rejection of strict restriction, there's, um, there's a rejection of the notion of something being impossible and in turn, something feeling more possible. And I think and hope there's something kind of uplifting about that message. So I wanted to create an artwork that would work anywhere across the UK and could pop up in all sorts of places. So we made three of these bronzes 
which is our knotted post boxes. And they tour and pop up all around the country. And it's great to be able to produce, share, um, install public artworks, irrespective of a commissioner. And that's a very liberating thing. Um, you know, like stakeholders are great, but my favorite commissioner is myself in a way, because I can conceive and create ideas um, without the pressures of um, a partnership in the nicest possible sense. Um, and this artwork allowed us to do that. And this has flowed into smaller objects. So while you, I suppose the work that gets seen and shared the most are the architectural interventions. As a sculptor, I'm not just interested in, in the kind of the, the monumental. It's, it's also just continuing that visual language and that kind of sculptural strategy um, into objects that surround us on a daily basis. And that while that sometimes focuses on the built environment, also focus on in, in interior spaces. This is our knotted fire extinguisher, for example, cast in bronze. And we photographed them in lots of different settings. And this was in a beautiful old carriage works in Kent, which is the largest um, single open room uh, listed building in the country. It's, it's an incredibly beautiful space. Um, our knotted grandfather clocks car carved from American black walnut, actually, that we ship as logs from Arizona. And our knotted coke cans cast in solid silver. Our knotted brooms. Our bowed mops. And finally, our symmetrically smashed mirrors. I said at the start, it's an incredibly hard trick to pull off. And this took me about four years to refine, but our symmetrically smashed mirrors um, with about 45 different pieces of glass on each pane. Um, and I like to end with this because I think that art, or well, certainly my art, is, is, this, is, is this kind of sense of you kind of take reference from the past, and I particularly enjoy working with the past, but then try to introduce kind of contemporary ideas and interventions um, through contemporary technologies and collaborations. And so while the works are all very kind of different in their materiality and size, there's always this common thread of magic and illusion. Um, and I think, you know, public art, if it's going to disrupt someone's day, you may as well do it in a positive way. And the wonderful thing about playful illusions is they just offer a momentary distraction from reality. And I think that art and the arts in general are a wonderful mechanism for escapism. And I don't want my work to remind people of them, their problems. I want my work to distract people from their problems. And kind of the defiance of restriction and the warping of reality and the kind of sprinkling of a momentary magic moment of magic hopefully does that so i'll leave it there and thank you very much okay thank you and that was alex chinnick who was talking about his work uh, sculptural work in uh, the built environment and beyond um we will likely have him as a guest later during the Q&A period, depending on how his uh, traffic goes. But um, finally, we have today, John Pugh, who is uh, for more than three decades, he's um, a world renowned Trump Loewe artist, uh, and he's engaged and captivated the public with large scale mural projects, many of which are in California. So John, feel free to take it away. I don't know if you're able to start your video now. Um, yeah, there absolutely. we go. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Really, I've really enjoyed the two previous uh, presentations. There's a lot of great stuff. I love those columns, <laughs> the way they're twisted into a knot. And uh, and then John Gunn, I really appreciated your show and talking about some of the lost art of live theater uh, or live performance. And I just wanted to share with you, if you're watching, John, that I'm currently designing a project for a a building in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm um, 
paying homage to Howard Thurston, which is someone that a lot of people forgot, but during Houdini's time was probably was considered the greatest musician, magician in the world or something like that. But uh, I'm sure you recognize who that is. So I, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen here. And um, let's see if I can get into uh, the very beginning with this. Um, Hopefully it'll just play. Where's my play button? Hmm. I'm not getting this to play for some reason. I see it on my screen, but maybe it's hidden. Oh, there it is. I had yeah. I had it kind of hidden. There it is. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. So I do trompe loi, which in French means, I'm, I'm sure not pronouncing it quite like the French do, means a trick of the eye. And, uh, Let's see if I can get this to pause. Oops, go back. And um, uh, it's on the top this time. Huh, interesting. Um, and I, I, I've heard a lot of great things about this idea of illusion. Uh, I don't know why, it, why this is acting different here. Um, and uh, that the idea of, huh, I don't know why I can't get this to stop. <laughs> it's acting different for some reason today. I'll just kind of go back here. Um, the idea of uh, someone being tricked is a, there's a universal appeal. And if, if they have the true experience of being tricked, um, they're they're invited into the piece. Like there's this human interaction. It's not like anamorphic art. How come I can't stop this? It's out of control here. Um, yeah, that's odd um, because on our end, uh, we just see what the one slide. Uh, of the building with the scaffolding. Oh, it's just stopped. Huh. I wonder why I'm not. Uh, huh. This is so weird because it just wants to just run off by itself on my screen. So I don't know what. I wish we could. I hope, so which one are you seeing right now? So I'm just curious. I'm seeing the um, building with the scaffolding. Looks like the start of the Chico project. Um, oh. Huh. Well, I'm not. I'm not getting the same. Huh. I'm not getting the same. So okay. Maybe what I'll do is I'll stop your sharing, and then we can try it. Uh, try it again, and then maybe this time when you share the, um, when you share the slides, uh, instead of doing play, maybe you do a full screen view. Okay. I'll yeah. try something. Like that. Maybe that'll work. Um, desktop. I'm gonna go into this. All right, and uh, this the full okay, a full screen share. Sorry about so under that. view. I think under view you might be able to zoom it to a full screen view. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Okay, um, there we go. Is that well? It's still not quite full. Maybe this. There we go. Oh. That's seems to be good enough, I guess. Anyway, so um, when picking a wall, I, I want to get the experience of having the illusion. And I'm sure magicians are interested in that, too. Like there's a universal appeal to that. People are delighted to be fooled. And I think with that human experience of being fooled, that the viewer uh, is then invited to investigate farther, farther. There's a bonding that goes on. And so the setup for the illusion for me is is paramount, like. You see these chalk things that are on the ground. I was kind of moving forward, where um, they're stretched out, and you have to get to a certain point to make this this work. Um, that's great. It's great for this photo moment and your phone and so forth. But it isn't really the human experience necessarily of having to be of, of being uh, fooled. And um, I like the idea of getting this perfect setup, where, uh, like, for example, on this wall there's a, a long corridor toward the wall, perpendicular view, where when, if someone's viewing it and if the painting's done correctly, it uh, the vanishing point is set correctly, like creating an illusion as if this actually existed, that people will actually think that the building has, in this case, uh, broken open. This is a, a mural. This is a sketch I did prior to the mural. Um, and uh, I did at, at Chico State, uh, Calif California State, State University, Chico, and it was uh, the kind of the mural that launched my career. And I just want to talk a little bit about 
some of the ways I accomplish these illusions. For example, creating a model is very important to me so I can mimic how it would actually look if it was three-dimensional with the shadows and so forth and the illusion. Um, and here I'm blocking in based on that model and using like a broomstick behind this clay thing where the shadows fall and developing the background and moving forward. Um, and here's a little example of a triglyph, which will look in like it's inside of this, this illusion where the, the wall is behind this broken wall. And you can see here where there's a subtle shift between a warmer, darker color. Can you see my cursor? And the cooler light color. And it's these, these subtle things like, like this, this, this area behind inside the shadow is slowly getting um, ambient light blocked from it. So it becomes warmer and darker. It's these subtle things that happen within the illusion that um, create the real illusion. The real trompe l'oeil is the subtle things that people don't notice, they, they can't see. Uh, like color shifting, for example, like here, this is going to be a block leaning against the wall. The front of the block is gonna reflect the yellow light of the sun more. So it's yellower, not just lighter. And the, the uh, shadow behind the block, we're removing the, the orange yellow sun and we're getting more of a purple color. So colors are very important. The color, the, the uh, hue shifting, the temperature shifting. Um, uh, this isn't that important only to say that sometimes trees get in the way <laughs> of some of the murals and um, it, it, I wasn't really allowed to like remove any trees, but I did make a deal with the grounds person to, um, I, I bought, I, I bought him a case of beer and he slowly trimmed away about three inches a week. So by the time I was finished for this project, the, um, tree was not blocking the project quite so much. And this is the finished piece. And this is really the piece that got my, my career going, um, and it was 1981. Um, and it, there's funny stories about all these pieces. There was a woman that worked across the street from this building. Uh, it is the entrance to Chico State University. And she sat at a desk at a window right across. And she watched as I put the scaffold up. And I painted the mural over the course of a couple months, brought the scaffold down. And she still called the administration building. And she goes, when are you going to fix that building? So... <laughs> It's amazing that people are not necessarily paying attention and you're catching them off guard. Here's a little close up of that. And another thing I wanted to point out too is, is uh, sometimes these murals get their own energy and psychology into the community. And this was right at the center of town. It was kind of a beloved mural. So the community actually protested when they were slated to tear this building down and build a performing arts center. But that the university did even prior to the protest commission me to repaint this mural. And here I'm in my studio with an assistant painting it on the material that I now use today. And I'll get into that more and recreated that mural um, on the new performing arts center. So it's, it's really exciting when a town really does embrace a piece. And um, three, five, seven, two, four, five. Um, okay, so I'll sorry. So I just wanna go back to the roots of some of this trompe l'oeil is the Italian Renaissance, here's a great example of, um, well, the, the roots are like during the Greek periods and before, but there are no surviving things from that except maybe some Roman things in Pompeii, but not much. I like this piece in particular because it shows this contrast between a painted surface and what looks like um, sculptural and architectural features. And I think that very contrast is what creates a heightened sense of illusion. And it creates an opportunity for me as an artist to play with this idea of here's a partly finished painting with a flatter look even and contrasting that with what looks like an artist out there that has fallen asleep on the scaffold um, and a bowl that somehow emerged out of this history lesson in the, in the mural um, are about to have a confrontation. But I think this contrast between a flatter painting and even a half finished painting and the architectural illusion with the shadows and the floor going into the piece more uh, heightens that sense of illusion. Here's another example, painted fresco from Kenosis. And, um, but um, that, and going back in perspective, the shadow crossing it, but it's all part of the illusion. Uh, Charles Peel did um, 
another thing that I think is great with um, a door frame and a, a architectural prop. So he's hiding this transition line between reality and illusion um, fairly effectively. And I've worked that into a lot of my pieces too. Like here's the casing, but then there's a closed door here that I've created to look like a, a, an open door. And uh, it's pretty uh, like almost twilight zone when someone actually pushes this door open to create the second door opening into this guy's theater in Los Altos. Um, this is one of my early influences too, is this, is this guy named Blue Cloud and he's in, in South uh, um, Carolina, or he was. And um, I always like the drama of this, not just an illusion, but uh, more of a concept. You see tunnel vision, across the top there, the word tunnel vision and, and very dynamic illusion going in. I, I was in high school when I saw this and I think it was one of my first inspirations for doing this mural thing. Uh, here's a smaller tunnel that I did fairly recently. And then Richard Haas is another um, architect that's very influential. He really uh, helped bring back the trompe l'oeil style into the public art scene. Very graphic, but it worked good from a distance. Here's the before wall over here on the left. You can even see where the boarded windows are and where those boarded windows have been unboarded and the painted illusion. So, and, and uh, um, Alex brought this up too, the idea of creating a spectacle or an anomaly, I think is very important. So the question would be with this, and Richard Haas definitely developed into much more exciting concepts and so forth. But if you didn't know that this mural was here, it's like the tree falling in the forest. Would you know that it was there? And I think it's really important to create for, for placemaking type of um, murals to um, create more of an anomaly or a spectacle, something that's unusual, even if it wasn't an illusion. So. Um, and this is a, actually a fairly early piece by me at the Stanford Shopping Center in uh, Palo Alto, California. Um, and I, some of the architects might appreciate this. It's kind of a, a, a colonnade uh, of historical arches going back from this neoclassical period that were in this chamber in front of the mural. And as we go back, we go by uh, Moorish and res uh, Renaissance and the uh, uh, going back into Byzantine and even some of the uh, the early Greek and Egyptian, and it actually circles back around, but uh, it was kind of a fun nautilus shaped corridor of uh, of time. And we're, we just happened to be in this this chamber in front, the, the living nautilus and looking at back at all the abandoned chambers. Um, okay, I'll keep an eye on my time here. An early piece I did in Los Gatos too, um, in this actually after the, I pressed unmute and on the keyboard. Okay. Um, this goes back into uh, the idea, the, the earthquake, where this broken wall thing became popular again, kind of. And um, they weren't sure if this building was going to come down or not. This is, this is in Los Gatos. So one of the solutions was to put these panels on the building. And if we needed to move it, um, we can move it. And that kind of mother really is the invention of, um, I mean, uh, uh, necessity really is the mother of invention because I started using panels more and realized that this this is a panel, a door. I painted the, the leaves around it, but I st this is all flat too. I started realizing that um, it's it's nice to be able to work inside of a studio and, and then bring it out there instead of being out in the elements and having a lot of interruptions. This is a small piece I did in Atherton. The big complaint I get with this one it, it's not that they try to pick up the glass, but they try to set the glass down next to it. <laughs> it, it ends up falling into their spa, but um, kind of a happy illusion thing. Um, again, the idea of panels now uh, and having boards put up prior to the panels. This is how I used to do it. This is in Winslow, Arizona. And it was uh, an international competition based on the song that has, uh, well, there's a girl, my Lord, and a flatbed Ford slowing down to take a look at me. Um, in it. And uh, actually this building caught on fire and this mural was almost completely destroyed by just, and this is act actually a redo, this, the girl in the flatbed port. We actually, my assistant, Lauren Johnson, and I just went and reinstalled this piece in Winslow, Arizona. And it's amazing how much uh, attention this piece gets. It's, I guess it's the number one visited spot on Route 66 now with the, the standing on the corner spot. 
All right, so now I'm using, this is a more modern thing. I showed that at the beginning when I was redoing the Taylor, the uh, uh, Chico State mural. And this is um, this non-woven media or, or poly tab that I, I treat with acrylic and paint on it prior to installation. You can see I've taped the shape of this, this Quetzalcoatl thing here in this, on this mural in Mexico City. And we've actually filled in uh, the grooves that go behind this material so it can mount flat onto the wall. And here I'm glazing in some scales. I, I've done, a, I'm re, in recent years, I've done much, much more glazing because I found that, that uh, as a, uh, the glazing effect can get more brilliant colors without losing information behind the piece. And, and then, of course, we got the shadow here and trying to mimic the stains of the concrete onto the painted shadow to have, um, uh, I think, an effective 3D illusion something I did for George R. R. Martin at his theater in Santa Fe. And again, the figures, I, ha I have a lot of, of these figures in my pieces. And I noticed that when Alex was showing his work, he always had a, a very often has surrogate figure or viewer. I, I, I like to put one into the piece. So there might be a secondary level of um, discovery where someone may even try to talk to some of these figures and they're not really there. So maybe a second layer of um, an illusion and being tricked by um, the illusionary figure. Um, and I just want to share a couple of these snake things. This was in Sacramento. And again, that glazing technique over gray tones seems to be, and this is very popular in the, uh, with the younger demographic, like on the uh, very viral with the Instagram kind of crowd. And I wanted to throw this in too, because I think I have, um, we're working toward a, a, a couple projects in Reno, and I'm working with the architects there. And this is a possible um, very, very tall 200-foot uh, high wall with um, um, an illusionary fish coming out of it. And then you notice that nose to the right. I'll share something with you how to break the picture plane without necessarily coming out from the wall, too. There's another illusionary effect. So I, I've done a lot of things with even art, different painting styles, glazed tile murals, and that contrast between this type of a different type of more two-dimensional artwork and the architecture continues to create a heightened illusion, in this case, uh, uh, a Yosemite-shaped architectural space. Um, oh, and here's a, a it's a uh, Miwok uh, Native American within the piece. A lot of times I do like to have discovery layers that have the history and people can discover them. In this case, um, this uh, Native American is keenly aware that he's inside the mural instead of farming the, the, the field. He's, he's kind of going, what is going on here? Um, other devices are using a mosaic to contrast um, the architectural illusion and to heighten that illusion. Um, and then just using nature in general, um, is something I've started to do quite a bit more too. This one's in New Zealand. I like the idea of this hidden little sculptural thing in the rock um, as a breadcrumb that leads more into this discovery and these layers of these. Um, um, this is a Papatua Nuka, and, it, and it's 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 a Maori symbol um, of Mother Earth, and it goes farther with the the process. Uh, uh, here's another thing with nature. It's kind of a surreal thing and three different perceptions that children are having. And I better not spend too much time with this. Um, they're all painting um, the, uh, the train that the dad um, uh, manages. Um, getting back into nature more, getting into this feng shui and this healing space. I started doing these type of things for hospitals more. And uh, the idea that you could be in a waiting room and waiting for a loved one and, and get into this healing kind of escapism as Alex would put it. Uh, this, this, this is before I install it, but it's at a juvenile hall visitors lobby. And going even farther is this, this Jules Verne tube that protects and encapsulate the, the Monterey Bay before um, we started doing all the clear cutting and so forth, what it looked like as a version coastline and the ship kind of uh, time stamps that uh, event and the scientist is taking readings, which is kind of an apt concept for Santa Cruz, California, where it's, they're very much into the pre uh, environmental preservation and the school of organic consciousness. Swimmers, and I, I don't, I kind of, I want to kind of 
get through some of these a little bit faster. So I apologize for the uh, visual uh, speed at which, at which I'm showing these. It, the, here's a, a good example of the integration between the illusionary line. Here's the bricks in front and then the illusionary bricks on the side. If you can see my cursor, there's the uh, transition point. So most of that is an illusion, but I think that that transition line does help. Yeah, right here, it's like goes from a, from a real brick to an illusionary brick. And I love doing these sculptures. Again, the color temperatures really assist with making this very believable. Even on the, the matter marble down at the bottom, you can kind of almost see a yellow, red to blue shift. So the color temperatures, and you really see it here in the marble, color temperatures are very, very important to create a sense of presence. A Rodin sculpture. Um, and here's a good example of breaking the picture plane, another device that I use a lot, including that trout that I showed you a few minutes ago. But just by having a flat plane uh, added on to the bottom and breaking the outside of the picture plane, not bringing it out three-dimensionally, but breaking the picture plane, I think really um, heightens the sense of illusion to the point where the head librarian was really complaining that students would come to her every day and say, did you know that your painting is <laughs> rolling off or falling off the wall it, it, to the point where she was actually irritated. So I feel bad for her, but I like the fact that the illusion is working so well. Uh, Hermosa Beach, this is the one that, that is at, actually at the on the front of the your presentation um, uh, flyer thing. And uh, and again, you can see this the 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 this little piece right here is breaking that picture plane that helps with this this view into the past the 1920s uh, uh in front of the Biltmore Hotel which no longer exists um at Hermosa Beach almost kind of a Mesa Verde view into the past uh and discovery of what it was like there 100 years ago And uh, this one in Minneapolis. And again, you can see that top part right there and right there. It's just a little piece of architectural foam that breaks the picture plane um, to help this wall. And I, Alex mentioned this too, the flexibility of building materials. This, and you can see the where the, uh, the, the picture plane is broken right there with the architectural foam. Um, but you can see um, how this material now is peeling more and not just within the wall, but it makes it feel like the building now with the with the, these pieces that are added uh, is actually being affected. And, and model building, I mentioned that at the beginning too, and I'll hurry up here. Here's a model that I used for that, that last piece. You can see the figures inside and the reflections. Here's a model for a project I did in Hawaii with a glass wave. <clears throat> and you can see, uh, I, th I consider this a pinnacle project, a very large project. You can see some of the process there and the use of that wave and the use of understanding that light, how it comes through there and Queen Lily Ukulani in the background. I probably added a few colors, but I really enjoyed doing that. And uh, playing with the architecture. Again, I think this really fits into the theme here of uh, uh, rotating the architecture, and uh, maybe it was subtle or one, but still um, an anomaly. Um, and I really enjoy it. This is near Chicago. And again, celebrating the idea of uh, the flappers here in the 1920s with little Georgie O'Keefe in the background there. And they're just up there um, 60 feet in the air enjoying a drink. <laughs> Close up of the figures. I wanted to include this too, because I'm almost done. Um, it has this Escher thing going on. And I don't know if this has ever done been done on a life-size building before uh, or in a contemporary sense like this, but I, this is also a possible project that I might be doing in Reno, Nevada. And um, the idea of having it life-size, I think would add something that Escher would have been um, pretty excited about that that sense of it of it being life size and more believable and in and, and, and more contemporary. There's room here for a lot of narrative to happen, even historical elements like uh, there's a Harris sign in there that's part of this story. But so I mean, uh, there's and, and these are some more recent projects. So uh, playing with things architecturally, creating anomalies, creating illusion, is a great way of. Uh, bonding with the viewer and bringing them and creating a sense of place and inviting them into the historical elements, the, the, the sense of place elements. It depends on which project I'm working on, 
Um, but I really do feel, especially the historical elements, what a great way to get them into the piece other than this categorical linear historical thing, but more through discovery layers after the initial uh, illusion has been accomplished. And uh, uh, I find it a great vehicle for public art because the illusion is, and Alex said, it creates a tremendous amount of attraction and attention and they tend to go viral. This is one that I did, um, uh, it was a Hollywood type thing. So they used the, 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 the building itself as a prop along with my illusion. Uh, and another piece I did um, in New York that was repeated in a, some major cities. Um, anyway, this kind of full circle here. Uh, and, and, and Alex mentioned too, lighting these things at night is really great because it gives it a lot more airtime and it's a little more theatrical and dynamic. But um, these pieces, if, if the illusion is working and it has something going on with some comparisons of time, it always brings up questions of the concept you know, I, I think this this is this concept is breaking down the educational facade, a modern educational facade, and kind of flaunting the the uh, cornerstone or foundation of our educational system. Um, but it could be a comparison of architecture of then and now, and there's all sorts of possibilities. But the and most important thing is if we're getting people to um, think. Basically, bottom line is if they're thinking about this, they're inspired to come up with their own um concepts or ideas um so i've taken up too much time as it is i really appreciate being here thank you john um at this point i'm going to invite all of our panelists to turn their videos back on and uh john pew or john gone excuse me um i'm going to ask to start your video here and unmute you um so oh and alex is here just hey. in time <laughs> I mean, I sat down 20 seconds ago. So oh, that's good timing. <laughs> wonderful timing. Sorry, See, I'm... it's yeah, good that you yeah, took longer. Yeah. yeah, it's good that you took longer, John. <laughs> so, oh. um, thanks, John. Yeah, <laughs> I mentioned you, Alex, by the way. <laughs> but, um, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, well, okay, cool. Uh, hopefully, positively. <laughs> but, well, thank you. Um, but yeah, um, sorry I'm late, but I'm pleasure to be here in person. Thank you. Great. <laughs> um, so we do have some questions from our people, so we're going to jump right into it. And, uh, you know, I'll start with more of a general question for everybody, and then um, maybe we'll go in uh, alphabetical order by last name, <laughs> just to make it easy on everybody. Um, now, uh, the big question I have that uh, it looks like Anna has too is how are your projects financed? How do you get the funding to do what you do? Uh, start with Alex. Um, well, um, through different mechanisms, mechanisms really. The early projects, I think as I probably said, there's far more artists than there are opportunities. So the, the most critical art form I ever taught myself was that of, of of self facilitation, so um, uh, to I always relied on ambition and risk as mechanisms to distinguish my work from others. So to facilitate that ambition, I I really had to, I mean you know a lot of work, but I had to I would conceive ideas and then go and find the partners and the sponsors and the companies um, to help facilitate them with me. And I would go through lots of different companies and lots of different suppliers until I found those that were willing to kind of sponsor the project, uh, whether it's materials or services. That was in the early days. Um, it's harder to do that now. And it increasingly feels less appropriate because there are budgets there. Um, and it, I, I think that in, certainly in the UK, the best, the best, no, the best is the wrong word. The, the, the biggest in terms of resource commissioners of public art are developers, property developers. I mean, this notion of placemaking is, um, is a wonderful thing. And um, given the nature of my work, it does translate into media reach and that does translate into footfall and spend. So um, developers largely. Um, we've done a couple of commercial projects. The first one um, was a, a peeling road with a car hanging upside down. I'm not sure if I showed that project. Um, and 
that's because we lost so much money on the hovering building in Covent Garden. <laughs> um, but um, l l developers, companies, um, that's how that's how we do it. And then the smaller works, we kind of self-finance. Um, the, the, the smaller works are great because they 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 have kind of unbound creative freedom, but they and they they allow us to explore sculptural territories that then inform and feed into the larger concepts and works. So um, a kind of combination of, of of means of funding the projects. Great, and I think John Gahn, you mentioned uh, working with a lot of entertainers and Hollywood and so forth. How um, how have you funded most of your work? Well, the of course they uh they come to me for a prop uh, uh that i deliver uh, to them so it's a a little simpler in my case that it's just a kind of a piece of furniture that is is fabricated in my shop and given to them great um and john pew uh is it uh, same yeah, sort well, of the, the, yeah. the first one at, at california state university chico that was more of a college project, but um, I've been very fortunate. I, 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 I've, I've entered a lot of national, international competitions, and I've been very successful with that. And it does seem like I don't have the budget maybe that Alex um, needs. Uh, so it's, it's a little more uh, cost effective to do a mural. <laughs> Um, but it's 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 between competitions and and now getting a lot of clients that see this as a, pl a placemaking thing that draws attention to their business. Cities that are, are adding to their public art comp uh, 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 gallery and uh, co collection and uh, um, and it, it's 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 it gets it had the building owner or the or the co the company owner is is happy. The public is happy, at least most of the time. And um, of course, I can be supported. So they, these do get funded, and uh, I'm, like I said, I'm very fortunate that way. Yeah, and uh, I'll just mention that San Francisco here. I'm sure other cities do. Usually, larger cities they have an Arts for Architecture program, um, which uh, I guess devotes a certain percentage of development uh, funds to uh, arts projects. So I'm sure that's how a lot of uh, some of your work um, comes about. Maybe yeah. One to two percent, a lot of art and public places programs, a lot. Yeah. Um, Cindy, did you have a question, or you might? Did you want me to take the next one? Or. Yeah. Well, actually, the the next question is actually kind of in my wheelhouse a bit, and that is um, directed at, at Alex. And and someone asks that they know that you're in the UK, but must you obtain building permit for the work that you do? Um. The, the short yes yeah the short answer is yes um so we have um typically we have planning and building control so which are two separate entities the building control and building regs are um a, a, a just a kind of a little bit of a technical look at the at the project um and naturally that the interrogation of that ranges with the scale and complexity of, of the artwork the the fun one with that was that the, the 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 house of the melting house had to kind of pass building regulations and snow loading and such um generally speaking i mean the 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 most laborious part of the project is probably the planning consent so in the uk any project lasting it, it varies to do with the location and different considerations but general rule is that any 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 kind of public intervention lasting more than 28 days requires planning consent so pretty much all of our projects um the temporary ones included but of course the permanent sculptures require planning consent i mean so yes the short answer is yes it's it's not my favorite part of the process um and uh we, we've come it's to local council we've we've it's getting easier the more i guess the more projects we deliver and i suppose as to a degree um the the brand or the you know the the, the portfolio accumulates uh, there's there's a kind of heightened degree of trust we're experiencing from um uh the various members at the council which could be planning officers or um arts public arts officers 
but that's an increasingly rare position as council funds become squeezed. Um, and generally they are supported, but at the same time, when a, like we're, we're working on a manner of complex, you know, when a loop de looping 40 meter chimney or a knotted red brick chimney turns up on their desk, there is probably a little bit of what, what am I supposed to do with this thing? <laughs> you know, like the, it, the problem is, is that typically they don't get praised when it's, when it goes right, but they certainly get challenged when it goes wrong. So by, by their very nature, planning officers have to tread with a degree of caution, I think. And, and um, yeah, they're, they're probably not pleased to see one of mine turn up on their desk because, you know, you, know, you can't. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, all of those things are required. Yeah. Yeah, I halfway expected as much, but um, yeah, I don't think that you can evade that. Uh, John, I, I would assume that you two have to go through a number of approvals in order before you can uh, proceed with your work. You know, it really depends because a lot of side, sign ordinances are sp specifically aimed at commercial things. And and a lot of towns, um, don't if it's public art, they don't. Of course, now with the urban art thing happening and just so much going on, there's probably more now. But um, um, I, a lot of times the art commission will be involved from the town and, and, and they'll have approval and that that will say, OK, this is legitimate. Like, mm -hmm. like here in Ashland, for example, I'm going through a public art commission just to have their their um, acknowledgement that the, that the city will take it into its collection. And I, I probably would get in trouble if I just tried to paint it without that. So, <laughs> yeah, but no building stuff, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Figure as much that there's, say, some some approval. It's just hard to do anything in the public realm, you know, outdoors without some approvals and not the least of which of course is the the erection of scaffolding things in the public space yeah. Yeah. yeah i'll watch take the next one john sure. Haber. yeah no the um there was a comment from john bacon there's a lot of johns in this room today <laughs> yeah um but there's a comment from john bacon in the audience and he said my employer who is uh, apparently the met museum in new york i think um did re recently did an exhibit on some uh, automata and uh, John gone I wanted to sort of maybe turn it over to you in terms of these um, these sort of commissioned machines I would say that were on the forefront of um, technology and ambition but they required probably funding from uh, people like the royal families and so forth do you think there's a place uh, in the future for things like this that um, you know with computerization and uh, everything that's occurred in the last hundred years or so uh, is there still a place uh, for automata and what, what is their place? Like, what, what do you think, uh, they, what sort of um, function do you think they should serve going forward? Well, I, I think that, uh, yeah, there's uh, definitely a place for, for these things. Uh, automata in general uh, uh, are, are really becoming more popular. The, most of my uh, reconditioning and uh, resurrection is uh, the pieces out, out of the 19th century, and they're mostly fringe pieces, and uh, they're very popular now. And I, I think, uh, as far as doing commissions on these uh, pieces, you can you can see like in in your in in in, in watches now, wristwatches, uh, the automation that's coming up. So people are interested in, in seeing things and uh, seeing how they work and the machinery of it all. And uh, anything visual like like uh, the other John, so what they do is uh, it's marvelous and uh, maybe sneak some animation into some of that down the line. Oh, yeah, we oh, yeah, we keep trying. Um, <laughs> keep trying. Yeah, we've designed some great kinetic works. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I won't go there. <laughs> I would say I imagine it increases the complexity of your work, uh, Alex, mm -hmm. <laughs> adding animation. Um, I, I was sort of struck earlier today when we were recording, you told us uh, or you told me how um, how you did the uh, the duplicate mirror sort of uh, item in your, the last slide that you showed. And uh, yeah. it was just it was a lot more complex than you would think it is, you know, in terms of putting so much effort into making that. And 
it required maybe you can describe a little bit about that but i also wanted to before yeah. i turn it over to you to alex is uh, bob here in the comments um wanted to say hi to john gone he says uh he wanted to know john if you still have macaws in your shop he worked for <laughs> you in the late 70s and he wanted to say thank you for your inspiration and influence well I like those guys uh maxi the 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 red wing when uh, uh he died at age 91 but oh. uh, we we miss him that's great um so maybe alex tell us about those mirrors i, I don't know what in what went into that how much i mean i don't know how much you want to re reveal as the uh as the creator of this illusion but um well i mean it's the same story for all of the sculptures really we take um these kind of collaborative and complex paths to reach what is seemingly simple outcomes. And um, I like to say that the kind of with, with surrealism, magic, any, any kind of all the arts, I suppose, but surrealism and minimalism, absolutely, kind of the greatest solution of all is that of effortlessness, you know, and you, you kind of have to hide the process or hide, hide the challenges and the complexities, I suppose. Because um, that's not the audience's problem. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, yeah, the mirrors, it's interesting. It's harder to make symmetrically smashed mirrors than it is to melt a house. <laughs> <It's weird. laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was a complex one. That, I mean, without going into the technical details of all of them, they all have their challenges. I mean, all of these things, largely because, I mean, not, you know, we're not like true innovators and utterly groundbreaking, but every single project that we create is kind of in a way different to the last, and they all come with challenges. Um, and that's, that's great. I mean, yeah, progress, there's no progress without risk, I guess. So they all have their kind of technical challenges and we welcome that. Certainly the works we're working on now, um, I guess they're taking about two years to produce. Um, the bronzes, they're, they're about six foot, let's, let's say we're making four or five bronzes at the moment that are ranged from about six to 10 feet. Um, they're so complex that they're taking a couple of years to make. So mm. um, yeah, they're, they're all they're all hard the mirrors were hard though yeah we had to make that work about 10 times before we got there with it um because yeah i mean the quality of execution is critical it's the only thing i trust now the, the only the, the only thing that has any degree of permanence is quality so we kind of we're quite painful with our process to reach the, the a, a good quality outcome these days yeah that's great. And I think with with everyone's work here today, um, it, it serves a very important purpose. Um, all of you sort of gave examples of how the past can be reinterpreted or reimagined in, in a new light um, by sort of tricking your senses, especially your visual senses, but also the other senses um, and making you think that something's there when maybe it's not really, you know, it is there in your mind, but it's not really there in a physical form in some ways. So um, it's just, it shows a lot of promise, I think, and in, in, especially in our circle as historic preservationist in telling stories about the past and how do you make the public really appreciate this long mm -hmm. arc of history um, that you've sort of helped retell in a new way. So maybe I, um, Cindy, I, I wanted to take one more question and then I'll turn it over to you if you wanted to ask sure. any final question. But my question is really, uh, it gets down to this is, how, how do you feel that your work um, tells this story of, of, of history, the, of, the, of the past especially, and how do you think it reimagines the sites that you um, uh, place your interventions in? Um, and for John Gahn, especially in terms of the um, the story of the mechanical Turk, especially, how do you think that retells the story of this sort of change in technology and in this um, uh, industrial revolution and everything um, in new ways? So maybe I'll start with Alex and John Pugh, and then John Gon, you can you can answer that. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in how you think it interprets his your work interprets history. 
Uh, well, I, I just know that with the, the illusion, I often create spaces and spaces for the architecture to shift backwards, but often there's many elements that go into uh, kind of not a, a linear history lesson, but embracing elements from the past and telling stories within that. Um, so it, there are history lessons, but it's done. In, I, I like to think they're done in ways that are are uh, have a little more humor or a little more wit, a little more juxtaposition. That's not necessarily you know straight out of the book, and in a, in, in kind of a new way of tapping into these portals in the history. Um, and again, the idea of using the illusion to have that experience of bonding, that universal appeal of being tricked and getting into the piece, uh, I think in some cases allows for viewers of public art to, to uh, maybe even for the first time, really explore the concepts within the piece and tell something significant about the area or the, the use of the building. Um, and that, creates a pride of place, you know, with that process. Um, so it's, it, it may not be as much of a subtle architectural thing always, but um, what a great place to interject that. Um, and the one thing great about illusion is you could skip through layers of time. It could be now, it could be a thousand years ago, it could be a hundred years ago. And these people could all be talking to each other within the illusion and it doesn't break the spell of the illusion. So it's, what a great place um, to have a fresher kind of sense of, of history uh, uh, without the history book, you know, being turned. <laughs> um, me? Me? Well, um, I guess we, we try to construct these, these, these sculptures or the, conceive these sculptures on the foundations of familiarity. And um, it, and that's where I think the 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 kind of the positive disruption of of familiarity um, offers a a kind of a, a wonderful distraction and escape. So by working with the past or or materials of the past or structures of the past, you're immediately playing with um, something that everybody knows and seemingly trusts and you kind of work with that as, as, as from there but also the work a lot of the work well all the work that we create in the public realm is contextually responsive and at times we're kind of fortunately given the opportunity to respond to his to a, an older or historic location and the strength of an illusion hinges on its believability and so therefore by making the work kind of contextually integrate um, as dynamically as possible, but simultaneously as kind of respectfully as possible. And, and that's a kind of hard balance to strike because um, you want to reimagine the location. You want to reinvigorate it respectfully because that encourages uh, revisits and a kind of reinterrogation of, of, of the structures itself. You know, it encourages people to come back um, and in, in it, in it shines a slightly different theatrical light on what was already present and it, it encourages people to kind of look at it again and I think that's a positive thing so um yeah I've lost my trail of thought really but ultimately I mean I don't I do it I don't kind of say we need this old site um we we kind of respond to the opportunity in the location because the work has to be the work has to be placed in, 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 and by working contextually, I just think that's critical in, in any kind of public intervention, particularly in a historic location, because some art is placed and some art is plonked. And the latter just lacks that um, mature, sensitive and dynamic kind of integration of the artwork into the location. And that I think is so critical. Yes, and um, the uh, the brick, the wax brick example, I think, is the perfect metaphor for that. Is uh, sort of the impermanence of history, but also um, j it just is so appropriate that you chose to put that building on the site of a former candle factory to retell the story of that uh, location through your work. Um, but also the fact that it everything here it it, it doesn't last forever, tends to melt away, just like that brick. 
but as historians and uh, preservationists, we always want to make sure it stays there as long as it can. So, um, yeah. John. <laughs> well, everything's getting older. You yeah. Know? And, uh, and I like that notion. And the melting house was, it was, it was because it was temporary. I, I was doing a lot of temporary work and I just wanted to design something where the ephemerality was intertwined with the narrative of the mm -hmm. experience, I suppose. And that, that did it quite neatly, I thought. So, John Gunn, you get to have the famous last words, I think, unless Cindy has a question for everybody. But, um, John Gunn, we wanted to know maybe uh, how your work in, um, especially I'm intrigued by your monumental effort to restore the, the Turk and uh, what was basically destroyed by fire. Um, and what, what was your motivation in that? Is it uh, to tell the story of the past, uh, to, re to reinterpret the past in a way or... Uh, I'm curious in hearing your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, as far as the, the Turk goes, uh, all through my magical life, and this is really kind of all I've ever done all, uh, since I was uh, back in grade school uh, working for magicians, and uh, there's engravings of the Turk, of course, in, in all of these books, and and I'm a very weak chess player, but uh, it it to me, it, it had to be uh, the product of a magician. It had to be the illusion that somebody had created there, and and sure enough, that's what it is. Uh, that uh, there's somebody inside that box that you cannot see, and it was invented uh, 250 years ago, and and the fact that it still works today uh, is is very rewarding for what I do. That it still has the entertainment value and the and the secret and 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 all of that. So. Um, that's kind of what, in my work, that's what I try to make uh, objects. Uh, my background is in furniture design. And so it's kind of like uh, hiding people in furniture, so to speak. You have a table out there on stage and, and something on the table, maybe. And uh, then all of a sudden, somebody hops out of that thing. So it's, it's all kind of the same. And uh, it, it is to try to bring over an illusion into architecture is the the places I I visit the even in my home I, I the architects were were uh, of course a mid-century modern as they call it and the the discovery of as you walk from room to room there of course there's there are no doors to speak of but you the the thrill of discovering spaces and views and all of that I think that is what appeals to uh, to the human spirit, and uh, that's what we're all trying to to pull together there and to to play with, so to speak. That's good. What a lovely way to end it. Thank you, thank you, John, John, John Pugh, Alex Chinnick. Thank you so much for being here today. Of course, John Haber. Um, so I want to thank everyone for participating in this today. And I want to make note of something that, that you all mentioned. It was about placemaking. And that really kind of is a segue into um, our annual conference um, for the people that are watching. Uh, we're going to be back in person, our annual conference at Fort Mason. And the theme is placemaking, placekeeping. And these have all been wonderful examples of different ways of approaching placemaking. So we thank you so much for your work that you do and for the inspiration that you impart. And um, just remind everyone that we have two more programs coming. Um, John Haber can describe, tell you when and, and what. And also don't forget about our auction and our um, end of year appeal. And please donate to CPF so we can keep these programs going. John, I'm gonna turn it over to you to close. Sure, yeah, this is part one of a three-part series. So um, we're kicking it off here with uh, the theme of um, uh, inspiration. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, the next one is enlightenment. Um, and enlightenment would be the lighting of historic properties or, or sites uh, using um, special colored lights and so forth and re really looking at the design of it. So there are two examples that we're looking at, which is uh, Descanso Gardens in, uh, down in Southern California and also Peacock Lane in Portland, which is a historic uh, 
a neighborhood in Portland known for its holiday displays, Christmas light displays. And um, Peacock Lane was re recently uh, nominated to the National Register. Oh, somebody's stealing the show from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Beautiful. I think he's excited about part two of the series. Yeah, um, I think so. Too. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sure>. um, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, Sorry. I bet you could auction off an hour with with the dog, John, and uh, people would like pay for it. Um, so part three will be um, covering, looking at the Wilshire Boulevard Temple and the Audrey Omers Pavilion addition to it. And uh, we're also looking at the Grace Cathedral and their historic um, site in terms of the on-site programming that they do. So we're looking at historic religious sites for part three, and that'll be on the 15th of December. And then as I mentioned uh, earlier, and as Cindy mentioned, our auction closes on the 16th. So we want to encourage everybody to bid and um, take a look at some of the items, including John Gon's private tour of his shop, and uh, thank you all for your time today. We'll see you at the next program next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you.